has more than 18 years of medical device research experience, having held key research positions at Stryker, Densely International, and Integra Life Sciences. Mr. Pomerick has successfully launched more than 25 class two medical devices for dental, orthopedic, neurosurgical, and extremity reconstruction. Uh, the company is Nova Bone Products, LLC, and it is a leading producer and marketer of bioactive synthetic bone graft substitutes and collagen-based medical devices for the regeneration of tissue. Please join me in welcoming Greg. Well, thank you, Lee. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to all of you today. Uh, so to get started, what I was going to talk about is the company, our bioactive glass technology, and more specifically, uh, some, show you about some of our products, how the products work, and some of the proof and clinical results we have. And then in addition to that, uh, over the last couple of years, we've kind of expanded our technology platform to include collagen. So we're going to talk a little bit about collagen, uh, some of our recent product launches of uh, collagen-containing products. And then we will also talk a little bit about some of the, how the collagen works and how the clinical application to some of these. Now, I don't know if you guys saw Chandra's talk, uh, I think it was two months ago. He's covering like wound dressing, so there might be a little redundancy and I would apologize for that, but uh, otherwise we'll just move along. All right, so the company was founded in 2002. Right now we have 40 employees and we're privately held. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Arthur Wotes is our president. Uh, we are headquartered in Florida and we have offices in China and India. Uh, we are also distributed internationally through MTF, which stands for the Musculoskeletal Tissue Foundation. So they have a presence in uh, more than 80 countries throughout the world. We're located on Highway 441, about a mile, mile and a half south of Progress Park. And the technology, as I mentioned, is primarily bioactive glass and collagen. The bioactive glass was actually developed right here at the University of Florida by Dr. Larry Hench in the late 1960s. Uh, we actually acquired the technology from US Biomaterials, who was, had a big presence in Progress Park a number of years ago. And the collagen technology that we're focused on was actually developed by Dr. Yanas at MIT in the late 1960s. So this is our new facility. I don't know if you guys have driven past this building, but it sat vacant for about, for, for a long time. It's uh, part of the, it was called the Webster Industrial Park. Uh, but it's 30,000 square feet. We did up until 2014, so we moved in here about uh, 16 months ago. We had a 7,500 square feet in Progress Park, and then we had another 3,500 square feet down off of 53rd Avenue in Gainesville. We combined them into a 30,000 square foot facility, and so it's, it's good progress for us. We're growing. Inside that building, we have seven ISO class seven clean rooms. So what ISO class seven means essentially is that there are less than 10,000 particles per cubic foot of air. Just for comparison, there's probably about 200,000 particles per cubic foot of air in here. You know, in these rooms, we have all of our manufacturing equipment. So we have, I do have a laser pointer, good. Uh, packaging equipment, we have a lyophilizer and all of our measuring equipment. And then we also have mixing and other packaging equipment and a mill, so this is where we do our different operations. And we also have them segregated by collagen-containing products and non-collagen products. Uh, this is our R&D laboratory. We have 2,500 square feet of lab space. In there, we just have a variety of different pieces of testing and analytical equipment. We have a mat mechanical test equipment, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but for, to pull things in tension to see how strong they are or squish them in compression. Uh, we also have uh, spectrophotometer, UV visible. We have circular dichroism, and we have something called SDS page, which are good tools for analyzing collagen. We have differential scanning calorimetry, uh, particle size analyzers, and just a whole variety of uh, different types of FTIR. So I don't know, uh, many of you may not be scientifically oriented, but it's, 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 
it's like a playground for scientists. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about, uh, we talked about our facility, talk a little bit about our products. Uh, one of the first products in, uh, was actually launched in 1993, and that's why I was saying earlier that our, we acquired things from U.S. biomaterials because our company's only been around since 2002. But one of the first bioactive glass products on the market was uh, called Perioglass, and it was for treating periodontal defects uh, in dentistry. And that's a, it's a granular bioactive glass material. It's 90 to 710 microns in size. So what that means is microns, uh, if you just put a decimal point in front of it, it'd be 0.7 millimeters. So it's, it's less than a millimeter in size. And the whole idea behind that is we wanted a product that would be resorbed by the body in under 12 months. So in order to do that, we had to size the particles appropriately so that the cells could digest them. Uh, in uh, 2005, we expanded upon that, but people wanted larger particles. They wanted a more compression-resistant uh, material to pack into a defect site. So what we did was we made a porous particle so the cells could go in and digest them from the inside out as well as from the outside in. So we could have a larger particle, compression-resistant particle that would uh, meet the clinician's needs. And then to further make it more friendly for the clinician, we made a Novobone putty in 2006. So this is taking the material and mixing it uh, with a carrier uh, such that it can be easily injected into the body. That was launched uh, 2006, as I had mentioned, in conjunction with MTF. They were our partners when we actually did this work. Uh, in 2011, we combined the larger porous particle with the putty, made out what they, we call a macropore SI, which is a compression resistant putty. And then in 2012, we made this delivery system such that it can go into minimally invasive surgeries. So if they want to do a spine surgery and it's a difficult to access place, they can go in, remove the disc uh, through uh, a minimally invasive approach, and then they're able to easily just inject a bone graft around the uh, implant that they place in there to maintain this uh, intervertebral space. All right, let's, okay, so that's, that's our in initial products, uh, actually before I started here four years ago, except for the delivery system, uh, which was something I had worked on. Um, but, so how does the material work? The way it works is it undergoes an ion exchange with the surrounding body fluid. It increases the localized pH, and then what it does is it's, it's, it's a glass, so it has a silicate backbone to it. But when you increase that local pH, you also break down that silica backbone, and you form with what's called silanol, so there's SIOH groups. Uh, again, I'm hoping that this isn't like going too far over people's heads. Uh, but anyhow, um, with that, uh, you get a condensation of those silanols and it forms a gel. And then with the ions that have been released and the interaction with the surrounding body fluid, you get precipitation of calcium phosphate, which organizes into hydroxyapatite. And if you don't know what hydroxyapatite is, that's the mineral part of your bone. So the nice thing about it for a synthetic material, it interacts with the surrounding body fluid. The take home is it does that and then it turns around and it makes bone mineral. The other nice thing about it uh, is that some of the work that Dr. Hench has done has proven that it stimulates the genes that are responsible for making bone forming cells, which are called osteoblasts. So basically the ions, when they are released from the glass, they reach a critical concentration which stimulates those genes. So not only are we forming hydroxyapatite mineral, but we're also stimulating the genes that help repair and regenerate the bone. So is it sort of like waking them up? Yeah, kind of. Or making them do their job a little faster. You know, because it, you know, the body already recognizes that there's a problem. There's a defect, there's a wound or something. So these will just kind of wake them up a little bit and get them motivated to move a little faster. 
Uh, and then, so that's how it works, and then where's the proof that it works? Here's a really, I, I always like this experiment because they actually grew bone in a Petri dish. So they took these bone-forming cells and they mixed it with the bioactive glass, and as you can see, this is just a, this is a blow-up of that, but this is actually bone that formed in a Petri dish. And that's, you know, if we can do it in a dish, in the body, it happens much more efficiently. Uh, so I always like to add some nice pictures about it, but so these materials, and it's required by the FDA, but have been implanted in numerous studies, preclinical studies. And what these pictures show us is that this is at four weeks. Red is bone. And uh, this, these are the glass particles. And this is like marrow space in between. So what, what has actually happened? Within four weeks, we have a lot of nice new bone formation. And then you can see by 12 weeks, uh, it's significant bone formation. So it basically stabilizes the site and helps to regenerate the bone. And these were put into defects that would not heal spontaneously. They would not heal on their own. Does the body ever reject anything like that? Uh, not this material, because it's wholly synthetic. I'd like to show this picture too because these are spherical particles that we used instead of the irregularly shaped ones from the last slide. But you could see at 12 weeks just a, a, a massive amount of bone growing around the particles. And these particles, by the time you get to a year, will be completely resorbed. Can you have too much bone? Uh, there is, not with this product, but there are products out there. They use something called a bone morphogenic protein. And what the problem was is bone morphogenic protein is one of those signaling molecules that tells your body, like, it, it, you know, make bone here. So what they were doing is Medtronic had the product approved for use in the lumbar spine. And some surgeons thought, well, if it grows bone great there, then we'll put it in the cervical and everywhere else. And what ended up happening is they grew too much bone and people would have trouble swallowing. You know what I mean? So they would go in because they had, you know, a herniated disc in their neck, and they go to repair that, and they put this around it to help fix it. But yes, that can occur depending on the type of graft material. These materials won't do it. All right, so we talked about the in vitro and preclinical studies, and then these, it's just kind of a quick run through of our clinical studies that have been done. Uh, the first one I talk about is an 88 patient study uh, for adult idiopathic scoliosis. So that's the curved spine. And we compared our product to iliac crest bone graft. And in that, what that study showed is that it was as effective as the iliac crest bone graft, which if, you, if you're not aware, iliac crest bone graft is like the standard of care. When they need uh, bone for your body, they'll just go to your iliac crest and they'll take it out of there first. But the problem is you also have pain there now and uh, you're missing some bone. And then there's also blood loss and everything else that's associated with that. So this study was not good for us in that it showed that we were as effective that, as that without having to go to another site and uh, disturb it. Um, and then here's the next one is a 64 patient. Uh, ACDF stands for um, anterior cervical discectomy fusion. Basically, it's fusion of the neck. And there are 64 patients treated. And the uh, results showed that when that combined with allograft, you had a 97% fusion rate without complications. So that's, you know, it's, it's, that's a good score for spine fusion. Uh, and here's another one, 20 patients, one and two level. This is anterior lumbar inner body fusion. So this is where they actually go from the front and they open you up and they move everything over and they access the spine that way. And uh, basically, the 100% fusion in combination with a, what they call a femoral ring allograft, and that is from a donor, and they use that as this kind of a spacer. Uh, this uh, one on the bottom here is 22 patients. This is posterior lumbar inner body fusion. So this is why I was talking about some of those difficult, the minimally uh, excess or minimally invasive types, so where they only do a small incision and they kind of go in there and remove the disc and put the uh, inner body spacer as well as grafting material around. This study showed we had a 90%, nearly 90% fusion rate rating after 12 months, 
while the Iliac Crest only had a 73% fusion rating after 24, and it did eventually catch up to that 90% at 32 months. So basically it was earlier bone formation with the Nova Bone product. So we're proud of these results, as you can guess. Uh, another cervical fusion, 10 patients, uh, Nova Bone plus Autograph showed earlier bone formation. And then here's some um, extremities, arms and legs. Uh, humeral shaft fractures, 47 patients, 25 received, received Nova Bone and 22 controls. Question about the, the lumbar and cervical fusion. Does it actually take the place of the cage? No, no, it's, it's just a graft that goes around. So what they want to do, the cage goes in there and it maintains the height, the, the spacing between the vertebral bodies. And then you want to put a graft material to promote fusion because the cage itself doesn't promote fusion. It's usually made out of like uh, metal or it's made out of like a, uh, a very robust polymer. So now with the humeral shaft fractures, 47 patients, 25 received Nova Bone, 22 uh, were controls, meaning they received the standard of care. And what it showed was 18 out of the 22 controls healed in 15.4 weeks with one non-union, which a non-union is really bad, 82% uh, rating for fusion. And that's just the way the clinicians are rating it. Uh, and then whereas with the Nova Bone, 25 out of 25 healed uh, in 12 weeks, so three and a half weeks earlier, uh, with no delayed or non-unions, with a 92% rating. There's another one, tibial fracture, so that's in your leg. 78 patients, 40 received the Nova Bone, 38 controls. Significant reduction in healing time, 12 and a half versus 15 and a half weeks. So, you know, the sooner you can get somebody up and moving again, the more beneficial it is. So is it weight bearing? Uh, at, those, at those times, 12 and a half and 15 and a half, yes. And then... Uh, one more, extremity non-union. So this is people that were treated and didn't heal. And the nice thing about it is primary healing observed in 96% of all uh, cases, callus formation observed in all the cases. So the, other, the one person that didn't actually uh, um, heal. How come? How come? Uh, smoking, diabetes, um, they're, they're usually the primary reasons that people don't heal. And then there's, you know, there's other, you know, immune disorders and things like that, but they're, they're the primary. All right, other uh, applications, limb salvage, you can see there's a severe break here and then it's corrected here. Uh, calcaneal fractures, so that's your heel. It's a difficult uh, bone to deal with. And then also for revision orthoplasty, so if somebody gets like a total hip replacement uh, over time, if they're not exercising enough and stuff like that, they can get uh, where the bone uh, not subsides, but um, it, it kind of resorbs. And then so you can add a graft material to actually rebuild the bone around the implant. Uh, we also have cranial remodeling, so it can actually be used as like a grout between bone flaps. So if they have to take somebody's skull apart for one reason or another and put it back together, whether to reshape it or uh, something like that. And it's also used in veterinary applications. So it talked about the bioactive glass. I want to talk a little bit about our collagen technology. So some fun facts about collagen, great for cocktail parties. We'll bring this up at your house. Um, but it's the most abundant protein at 25 to 35%, uh, and the major component of most animal tissues. So it's 23% of your bone, 50% of cartilage, 74% of skin. Tight is a principal collagen of skin and bone, obviously. Uh, approximately 30% of all protein in the human body is collagen. Type one collagen fibrils are stronger than steel. Um, it, collagen production typically declines after age 40. I hate to break that to everybody, but I'm working on fixing that. Uh, it's also in medical products can be derived from a variety of sources, human, bovine, porcine, equine, and ovine. So for those of you unfamiliar with those terms, but it's human, cow, pigs, horses, and sheep. And more than 25 distinct collagen types have been identified, each encoded by a separate gene. So different genes make different types of collagen. All right, so these are some of our recent products. In August 2014, we launched this product. It's just a mixture 
of um, bioactive glass and collagen. And basically what we do is we give the surgeon a little mixing cup. So he can take human bone marrow and put it in there. And those of you who saw Chandra's presentation, he talked about having a scaffold, cells, and signal. And that's what that gives you. If you take bone marrow and you mix it with the bioglass, you get the scaffold, cells, and signals. The collagen and the bioglass will provide the scaffold and some signaling. And then you'll also get signaling proteins from the bone marrow as well as cells. So do you keep this product on the shelf, or mm -hmm. does it need to be refrigerated? No refrigeration necessary. And uh, right now they have a two-year shelf life, but in time, you know, you, you can only get your shelf life as long as you've had the product. So we started working on these in like 2012. So in 2014, when we launched the product, we have a two-year shelf life. Next year, we'll have a three-year and so on and so forth. Um, because we have to demonstrate to FDA that it still performs as intended at the end of its shelf life before we can extend it. Uh, mixes well with blood and bone marrow, as I had mentioned. And then we also have this other product that launched at the same time, but this is just a preformed um, block that is 90% bioactive glass. And what they do is they add some bone marrow to it, which I actually have a little bit of a kind of like this, and they can mold it into a putty. Now, this product here was launched in, actually, it was Halloween. I was sitting around a campfire and I got a call from a regulatory person. And she's like, you won't believe it, they approved it. But so it was, it was a nice Halloween uh, event for me, but um, because we went through a lot of back and forth with FDA and they had a lot of questions on that. How much would a strip like that cost? Depends on the size. We go anywhere from one cc up to 20 cc's and it's probably, I mean, it, it's, I'm saying probably about $150 a cc. It can be rather expensive. You said in a lot of studies you had conducted, um, how much did you have invested in your clinical trials and ultimately what was your FDA classification? These are FDA class two devices. And we invest, your ISO 10993 testing is about $150,000. I just got a quote for another product we're doing at 137. And then um, the preclinical studies usually are about 150 to 200, you know, because what we find is that the place that does the studies, 50 or 60, the surgeons, 15, the uh, histology is another 30 or 40, the pathologist is another $30,000 when you add it all up. So you're looking at a total of around $300,000 just for that, and that doesn't include the bench testing that you have to do, like that lab full of equipment. Obviously, there's, there's a reason we have all that equipment. It's not just to be a playground for scientists. How long did it take for them to approve it? Um, once we got them everything they wanted, I mean, in total, it took about three years. Uh, there were things we could have done a little bit better that could have saved us about six months. But, but for the most part, yes, it's about three years. And so this is the other product. This is a what we call our bioactive strip. This is 95% bioactive glass. And the nice thing about it, this one doesn't form a putty. It actually forms a moldable material, I mean a, a flexible material. So they can put this in places where if they want to conform it to the shape of a bone or something like that. Um, so after they hydrate it with bone marrow, they can you know, implant it and, you know, like I said, it, it'll conform to the site they place it in. All right. So a little bit about, you know, I was mentioning about histopathology and histomorphometry. This is actually right out of some of the stuff we had to provide to FDA. Nice thing about that is this is three weeks. The pink area is immature bone. So this is all where bone is forming. So we're kind of really happy about that because this circle shows you where the original defect was. And this defect is created such that it's of a size that would not heal spontaneously, as I've mentioned before. So what's nice is at three weeks, you see a lot of bone already forming. And then these are just blow-ups, and these are all the different cells, and we can get into that if you really want, but osteoblasts are, you know, these little yellow ones, so you can look around and see some osteoblasts here and there. Um, and then at six weeks, you see more of this blue. The blue is mature bone. So as the bone matures and mineralizes, it uh, stains differently. So you see still all the pink, and then you see the more blue uh, coming into the picture, and you can see that in these as well. 
And then here at 12 weeks, you see a lot more blue, and it's starting to remodel completely to the normal anatomy, because it's also at points like you see out here, there's not always a lot of bone. So it's, it's remodeling to the point where, the, where it was originally, you know what I mean? So even though like we have a lot of dense bone in here, by the time it gets down to 12 weeks, it's starting to get to where it anatomically is correct. All right, so collagen bioglass composites, bioactive composites, as I mentioned before, they form hydroxyapatite mineral, which is bone mineral. They uh, stimulate the genes and also provide a structure as a scaffold for cells to promote vascularization. And it also functions as a conduit. So it's basically a kind of connector between uh, the good bone on all sides to help it, the bone have a place to grow into. It's highly biocompatible, minimizes inflammation. And it also, this is a point that I'm probably going to mention a couple more times, but it has controlled biodegradation. So the composite is resorbed at the same rate in which the new um, tissue is formed. So that's, that's really a key, because if you have something that's not going away, then the body can't do anything with it, and it'll just put a fibrous tissue encapsulation around it. You know, kind of like if you got a splinter and you never took it out. Uh, and it also maintains the osteogenic elements, so bone forming elements at that site. So if it's a more dynamic site, it won't kind of migrate away because it has a scaffold to hang on to. Uh, these are some products that we launched in, sorry about the colors, by the way, uh, but these are some of the products that we launched in January 2015. So we're again happy with these. These are all collagen products, they are wound dressings. As I mentioned, you know, I know uh, Chandra talked a little bit about some of these, so I won't go into too much detail, but this is a, a dental plug, so for, it's to be placed in a, to an extraction site. And this is also a dental product that per, when they open up the gums and they do something to the bone, they put this over that site so the bone doesn't kind of fuse to the gums above them, or at least not too robustly. Basically, it prevents a massive amount of scar tissue from forming. And I, like I said, I love these pictures because they're very colorful. And, um, but what they show you is that as early as two weeks, this site is practically healed. And then you just see at four weeks, it's a little more organized. Uh, and then by eight weeks, this is what it looks like pretty much untreated as well. So it's, it's a uh, it's, it's a nice demonstration of the use of the product and how it works. Uh, so how does it work? Um, basically, I always like to use the analogy of scaffolding on a building. So you know, you put scaffolding on a building, the workers have a place to go and do their job, right? Well, the same thing, you put scaffolding in the body, the cells have a place to go and do their job. And then what happens is it depends on the type of worker you put on that building. So I mean, you know, you're not gonna put a carpenter up if you need brickwork done. So the body does the same thing. The body will bring in the appropriate cells and it will repair bone or it will repair soft tissue. And so the, the type of work you get done is the type, depends on the type of cells that are present. And then the other nice thing about it, as the workers complete their job, they remove the scaffolding. And similarly, the cells do the same thing. As the job is done, they break down. They release enzymes to break down the scaffolding. So, and then this is a little bit more into the phases of wound healing. Uh, inflammatory phase, proliferation phase, and maturation phase. So basically, an inflammatory phase is when you first get the wound. You know, so your body's going to, uh, when we put the collagen in there, it's gonna act as a hemostatic sponge to stop the bleeding, form a fibrin clot. Uh, and that does that because collagen is a protein and it can interact with other proteins from the blood, cerebral spinal fluid, depending on where it's placed. Uh, various factors are released to attract the cells, like macrophages and stuff. They'll go in and they'll destroy all the bad materials, all the dead tissue, things uh, that they don't, you know, the body doesn't want there. And then also factors are released that will initiate the proliferation phase. In the proliferation phase, you get um, basically the, what the body wants to do is it just wants to throw everything at, at it can at it and form a big scar. And what the collagen matrix does is it prevents that from happening. It guides the regeneration such that you you uh, form near normal tissue or normal tissue. It regenerates back to the way it should be. And as I mentioned before, and I'll mention again, the resorption rate of the matrix occurs at the same rate of the formation of the new tissue. 
And in the proliferation phase, as the fibers are laid down randomly and are lightly cross-linked into large, loosely packed bundles, and then we go into the matur maturation phase, uh, in which they complete the resorption of the matrix, the fibroblasts uh, leave the wound, and the immature collagen is remodeled into an organized matrix, again, analogous to the original tissue. All right, uh, so this is just an example. Uh, well, clinical application. So, you know, when you talk about wound healing, you really talk about regeneration of the dermis. So I just put this little, uh, you know, and as had been mentioned in previous talks, you know, it, for burns, split and full thickness wounds, surgical and diabetic ulcers, uh, all sorts of things. But this is, a, I, I like this a little bit just to show you. This is what they call a bilayer wound matrix. So there was a wound here, and the doctors go in and they clean up all the burnt, dead, damaged tissue that they can and get it down to healthy tissue. And then they put something like this in there. This is a collagen matrix. This one in particular is a silicone layer, and that just controls fluid transport in and out of the wound. Like if it's a burn, you didn't want excessive wound exudate to just keep exiting from the body. Um, and also it prevents bacteria and stuff like that from going the other direction. So then here at about seven weeks, you can see that the scaffold here is being infiltrated with cells and you're starting to have blood vessels forming and stuff like that. By about 14 weeks, the collagen, or 14 days, I'm sorry, the, the collagen is mostly resorbed and you are, it, the silicone layer detaches and gets pulled away. And then what they do, since your body cannot regenerate hair follicles and sweat glands, they will go elsewhere on your body, and they'll be planning for this while all this is going on. They'll go elsewhere on your body, and they will take a epidermal graft. And then what they'll do is they will mesh that, and they will stretch it. So, you know, they'll take like a, maybe a small piece and stretch that out. So when it finally regenerates, you do have those hair follicles, sweat glands, and things like that in your regenerated tissue. So another clinical application, oh, this is just the mechanism of that. So the biggest thing is to prevent scar tissue formation. Like if you've ever seen somebody who had a burn that didn't have it treated, they have a lot of scar tissue and things like that. But they have ways of preventing that now. Uh, also prevent infection, as I said, you know, it, it, it controls the fluid transport going out, but also controls what's going back in. Um, it's designed for specific applications, like for example, we're using type 1 collagen. We have certain pore sizes that we know that the cells prefer for their scaffolding. And we also, uh, again, the degradation rate I've talked about. Basically, it controls the migration and rate of tissue-specific cell types. So you want certain cells in, but not everything. And um, Again, this is another way of saying it resorbs it at the same rate of new tissue. Okay, so here's another application for a collagen matrix. This is duraplasty. So anybody who's had brain surgery, in order to get to the brain, they have to go through the dura. The dura is a three-layer membrane, which is the dura matter, which is a tough fibrous connective tissue, arachnoid matter, which is an elastic web-like layer, and then the pia matter, which is an intimate contact with the brain, has a lot of the blood vessels and stuff like that for delivering nutrients and removing uh, waste as well as taking care of you know, oxygen and things like that. It's about 85% door itself is 85% type 1 collagen, 15% elastin, and provides uh, what the collagen does, it'll provide a mechanical strength and support structure. So how does it work? The collagen matrix, if it's placed on a breach in the dura, will interact with the proteins of the cerebral spinal fluid and form a fibrin clot. And then it provides a scaffold for the fibroblast to go in and regenerate the tissue, again, without abundant scar tissue formation, because that's really the key of all these scaffolds and matrices, is to guide the regeneration of the tissue as opposed to just have a massive amount of scar tissue forming. Uh, cells release enzyme to digest the implanted collagen, and the doors regenerate at a rate, again, consistent with that of new tissue. That's very important as well, because there are materials out there that don't work that way, and when they don't work that way, that's when you get fibrous tissue encapsulation and scar tissue formation. And we control the rate of degradation through cross-linking of the collagen matrix. All right, here's another one. This one, I think, uh, people might be able to get a good feeling for is if you know anybody who has spine surgery, why do they have spine surgery? They have spine surgery because they have massive back pain. But a lot of people, like I, I think it's on the order of 25 to 30 percent, after spine surgery still have back pain, but they have pain for a different reason. They have pain because scar tissue forms 
and tethers, these are peripheral nerves and this is your spinal cord, but this is scar tissue. If that's forming and tethering to it, every time you go to move, it's pulling on that nerve or it's pulling on the spinal cord and it's causing pain. So again, the way it works is it prevents that from happening. It guides the regeneration of the tissue. So preventing rapid scar, scar tissue formation, controlling the rate of the, of the growth of the new tissue. And this is just saying that uh, after treatment with a collagen-based adhesion barrier, patients suffering from severe pain show a lower incidence of adhesion formation as confirmed by MRI, and incidence of reoperation as a result of pain and or adhesion formation was considerably lower. All right, and then this is the last clinical application I want to talk about is repair of peripheral nerves. So they used to use collagen, or they used to use silicone tubes or autograph to repair peripheral nerves, or, or I mean allograft. Well, no, they would use autograph too. They would take it from a, another nerve in the body, but they, they would that or allograft or something like that. And for various reasons, those aren't the best options. Uh, and what they did is actually, this work was originally done at Duke University back in like the 1980s, uh, where they made these collagen tubes. And the collagen tubes, uh, what they do is kind of like a wire connector. So if you've ever done any electrical work around your house, you put each end of the wire into a wire connector, you crimp it and you're good to go. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. Put each end of the nerve in, suture it a little bit. And they, what they do is they fill the, uh, here they're doing it with saline. And Basically, what, what it does is it just pr allows the axons to grow along and reconnect to each other. So it's kind of reestablishes that connection. And uh, now they do different things where they'll put a aligned fibers in there. So it helps it actually have a little thing to grab onto and pull itself along, uh, especially for longer gaps. Because sometimes when somebody has an injury, your nerve will actually kind of retract a little bit. And even though the injury was only a cut, the gap they might have to fill might be uh, four centimeters or something to that effect. And basically what it does is it combines the nerve growth factors uh, within the conduit, but it allows for the transport of nutrients in and out because it's got some porosity to it. And it also restores the function of the nerve and prevents what they call an end bulb neuroma. So if it doesn't get treated, it'll just form like a, like a little onion bulb. And that'll actually be a painful place to touch on somebody. And these are some of the people that helped us do all that work. I will say all but one are UF graduates. So that's, you can see it's a very good source of uh, engineers and technical people for us. Yes? Uh, from, from the business standpoint, getting your product to the market, what distribution channels do you use? We have a network of distributors. So we have about 150 independent reps throughout the U.S. And then, as I had mentioned earlier, as, uh, outside the U.S., we are teamed up with MTF. Any other questions? Yes, Chris? This might be really a dumb question, but I'm wondering if there are any applications for uh, people with osteoporosis. Or is it strictly for smaller areas? It's, it's a good question. And um, the, this is really for a, a smaller area as opposed to a chronic condition. That's why usually like the, the drug products or something to help. I mean, of course, exercise is always a, a good thing. But uh, yeah, this, this is more for a, a particular site as opposed to a, throughout the whole body. So what percentage do you focus on tissue and what percentage on bone? Well, right now we're focusing more on tissue because we probably have one of the largest offerings of bone grafting uh, products of any company. Um, you know, we have all the bioactive glass and we have all the bioactive glass and collagen type products. So we're now expanding more into the soft tissue for the nerve, the duroplasty, the wound, and things like that. So are you direct competitors with RTI and Axogen? Uh, yes and no. Our stuff is not human-derived. So that's kind of where we're different. And people feel differently about 
whether they're receiving human-derived product or you know, animal-derived product. Um, but in some cases we do, but in most cases we don't. Because there's, you know, they'll, they'll be doing like fresh frozen allograft or they'll be doing, um, you know, stuff where they take bone and remove the mineral and sell the, the collagenous mass and, you know, signaling molecules are supposed to be remaining. And then, so we're not doing that. We're really providing the scaffold and the docs can get their own signaling molecules and things like that directly from the patient. Is there anyone else that competes with you in bioglass space? Well, no, there's a lot of people that sell, you know, hydroxyapatite products or calcium phosphate products, but they don't do that gene uh, stimulation and they don't have the bioactivity that we have. But there, yeah, there's a lot of companies out there with, you know, those types of things. And there are companies, you know, like the RTI where they do DBM and there's other companies where they take the collagen out of the bone and sell ground up bone mineral and things like that. But yeah, there are, and there, there are a few other bioactive glass companies, unfortunately. Do you all have the kind of the intellectual property where you kind of have the leg, the leg up on those individuals? Though? Not anymore, but we're trying. I mean, we've just filed for 12 patents. And so we're, we're trying to kind of build that, but it's, you know what it is? It's a tightrope walk. And then the, also the patent office has changed the way they operate. So they kind of, you know, the, the, everything I do, I submit a patent and go, oh, that's obvious. And then we have to prove to them how it's not obvious because they have this obvious, obviousness claim for everything. And I, I don't know anybody that gets a patent right away. They usually reject it once or twice. And then eventually you can kind of get where you're going. So. Yes. And is your wound dressing have to be refrigerated or, or can it store it on shelf? Uh, it is, yeah, it's, it's shelf stable, no, no refrigeration, anything like that. Could someone use no bone and the uh, skin grafts at the same time? Like sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do things like that. They'll mix DBM and, you know, our bone grafting materials, or they'll mix allograft and our bone grafting materials, oh. things along those lines. How do I blame them where it's a bias, you know, where they take it from your side, the bone marrow? And oh, iliac crest bone graft? Yes. Uh, what's the difference in price and time of healing for doing that process versus yours? Well, the time of healing is going to be about the same. Like if you have spine surgery and they open up your hip to get some bone for that, the, the time of healing is going to be the same. It's really going to be the discomfort of having another site opened. And also now that site's going to be devoid of bone and that, you know, can have some impact. Uh, but, well, there's other things though. With the Nova Bone, like some of our clinical studies have shown that you can heal faster by adding the Nova Bone to it because, like we were talking about earlier, it kind of wakes things up and speeds them up a little bit. So that's kind of the, the goal is to heal faster as well as as effectively as the gold standard. And the gold standard is your own bone. But in difference in price, is well, I'm wondering if they're doing another surgery that would drive up the cost sure. and time. Sure. I, I don't know the math on that. That's really the marketing and sales guys. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure they have a, a better answer than I would. I, I would think, yes, the other surgery and the increased OR time, things like that, versus the cost of the graft. And that's probably where you get a lot of your pricing. Uh, the other parts of your pricing are all that, you know, we were talking about how much these studies cost and things like that, so. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Greg. And here is a token of our appreciation for you coming. Wow. Great presentation. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it, and thank you for having me. Thank you very much.